So we are going to introduce the idea of a quadratic residue and go through some examples. It turns out that many important theorems in elementary number theory are based on the idea of quadratic residues. Now the idea of quadratic residues comes from this form of a congruence. For some integer c that we choose beforehand, we want to see if we can solve the congruence x squared is congruent to c mod some prime number p. Now this congruence doesn't always have a solution if we set a fixed value of c. For example, the congruence x squared is congruent to 3 mod 5. This congruence has no solutions. There is no integer x where when we square it, we get 3 mod 5. Now when there is a solution, we say that c is a quadratic residue mod p. And when there is no solution, we say it's a quadratic non-residue. For example, we would say that 3 is a quadratic non-residue mod 5. As an example, let's go through the quadratic residues mod 5, and we'll also see an interesting pattern that emerges there. Now, if we want to find all of the quadratic residues mod 5, what we can do is take all of the unique numbers mod 5 and square them, and then see which numbers we get as results. So the numbers that are unique mod 5 are going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Any number that's bigger than 4 is going to be congruent to one of these mod 5, so it's going to give the same results. If we square each of these, 0 squared is 0, 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, but we can reduce 9 mod 5, and that's going to give us 4 mod 5. And then 4 squared is 16. And if we reduce 16 mod 5, we're going to get 1. Now, one thing I'll note with quadratic residues is we do see that 0 ends up being the square of some number mod 5. But we often don't count 0 as a quadratic residue because, first of all, it's a quadratic residue of everything. But second of all, it often doesn't work with theorems that apply to any other quadratic residue. So we don't usually count 0 as a quadratic residue, but we do count the other integers. And in this case, we see that 1 and 4 are the only integers that we can get when we square another integer mod 5. On the other hand, the other residues, 2 and 3, would be quadratic non-residues mod 5. Now you might notice that this table seems kind of symmetric. We have 1 at the beginning and the end, and then we have 4 two times in the middle. And that actually comes from a general fact. Notice that if we have x squared being congruent to some number c mod 5, we also know that negative x squared is congruent to c mod 5, because negative x squared is the same as x squared. However, when we're working with modular arithmetic, we can also add a 5 into the inside of this exponent here, because 5 mod 5 is 0. So when we add this number, it's not going to change our result. What that means is that if x squared is congruent to some number, then 5 minus x squared will be congruent to the same number. So we see in this case, for example, 2 squared is 4, and 5 minus 2, which is 3, also it gets 4 after we square it and then reduce mod 5. Now one of the consequences of this fact is that any time we have a quadratic residue, there are going to be two different numbers that give that result, mod 5. It's going to be the first solution that we find and then p minus that solution. Both are going to give us the same result, so there will always be two solutions any time a number is a quadratic residue. So that's how quadratic residues work. We say that a number is a quadratic residue if there's some other integer that when we square it, it's congruent to c mod p. And we'll see a lot of important theorems later on in elementary number theory that are related to the idea of a quadratic residue mod p.